I promised that we'd have maximum time for dialogue, and so let's do it. Who wants to be brave enough to put their hand up? I see a brave person. We have a mic that's going to come around, and uh, anything you like. Hand up. I'm, I'm, I'm particularly curious if um, my family has been wondering why Trudeau is just like so adamant about this thing going ahead. And we're wondering whether FIPA has anything to do with the decision. FIPA? The, FIPA, FIPA. The, the commitment that the Canadian government made under the uh, Harper regime to build a pipeline to the coast in 20, I think it was 2013 or 2014. The quick and dirty answer is no. Um, that uh, particular agreement with the Chinese uh, should apply to a Chinese investment, um, which Canada got in the way of, but that's not the case here. We have two microphones now. This is great. Here's one. Hello. Um, one thing that doesn't seem to ever get discussed with regards to the Trans Mountain Pipeline is the fact that Vancouver is in an earthquake zone. And those tankers are sitting on top of a mountain. And they want to increase the size and capacity of those tankers. Now the ones that currently sit there have been sitting there for a very long time. And I think they're just an accident waiting to happen. That bitumen is going to blow down like lava and destroy the whole city. So that never gets discussed, never gets talked about. You know, I'm the biggest critic of the National Energy Board process that didn't allow cross-examination, that didn't allow much to talk about the, the coast part of it, you know, this, that was all off limits, etc. There was some stuff talked about in the seismic material, but it's not very definitive. I think there's real problems. Also, the pipeline has already burst in the past in Burnaby, and we've had you know, millions of dollars of property damage for a tiny little spill. You can only imagine if there were one of the kind that you're anticipating if there's a seismic event. So yes, that's just a whole other level of risk we rarely talk about. Most of us here in Victoria, certainly myself, are worried more about the like the, what we just saw happen, the, the Nathan Stewart thing up in Bella Bella, a little tiny spill costing lots and lots of money. Human error, somebody fell asleep. Same thing happened with Exxon Valdez many years ago, as you know. That's the kind of, of risks that we're facing, but this is risk upon risk upon risk. And at some point, is the risk worth the benefit? I don't know if people are and, there. And by the way, just by the way, we are in the single riskiest building in the <laughs> And tomorrow night there's a fundraiser I hope you're all at for Vic High because we're trying to see if we can get people to stand behind the, what, 60 million? I forget how much will be required to fix this and uh, it's a very controversial matter but I hope the federal government will step up for it. <laughs> I spent Monday at the uh, meeting of all of us with at least 35 years experience on the renegotiation of the Columbia River Treaty. My director was the author of that treaty in 1964, Frank Clark. In 2001, uh, we were going to have the world's largest LNG storage tank in Gibson's because the American community, coastal communities did not want that. We stopped it with freshwater fish that were of uh, a unique or DNA. The Squamish nation didn't want to lose the diversity. Um, what people don't understand, there's another angle to this, is the man management of all fresh water in Canada, which I worked in in the Inland Waters Directorate until 1995. That was a federal mandate for the whole country. That was downloaded to the provinces in 1995, so it's fragmented. What it means, I also worked in salmon enhancement and stream keeping in West Vancouver after I left the department. What that means is, that if we have an oil spill in fresh water, that the provincial government is in charge, not Ottawa. So that ignores NAFTA. It gets past NAFTA. And what we were doing on the LNG, while we were doing the LNG storage and a few other environmental problems that were hitting the, the House Sound region, they privatized and sold a lot of what Wacky Bennett developed as our resource companies to the Americans. No, I'm not being, I'll say foreign countries, foreign companies. 
And that, in that way, if we were trying to do environmental lawsuits in Canada to protect our community, we could be personally sued under the NAFTA by any foreign ownership. And that was a way of outmaneuvering us on protecting the environment in our community. And what I'm saying is that when we have these freshwater issues where the scent, where the oil hits the, the water and the fish, fish habitat, we have jurisdiction, not Ottawa. I think that question is, is helpful because it also puts in, in place one of the latter, last points that Harry made. Uh, British Columbia has a lawsuit. British Columbia has, you know, talked about the Como case and, you know, whether the province has got as much jurisdiction. Ottawa usually scoffs at it. It's funny. Ottawa said, why don't, it was proposed by Jamin Singh, as I remember, let's have a big reference case to the Supreme Court. Invite Alberta, invite First Nations, invite BC, invite Ottawa. Let's get at it right now. Feds say, oh no, no, there's no reason for that. We're 100% certain the way Harry described the fact that, you know, the province has got, uh, the federal government has jurisdiction over interprovincial pipelines, no problem. But then the federal, the provincial government has put before our BC Court of Appeal a question, a reference question, which is can we control the stuff that's in that pipeline? Because we have responsibility, as you rightly pointed out, over fresh water and land and air. Uh, in our province. And so to what extent will the courts say, you know what, British Columbia, you do have the ability to do that, or will they say, once the federal government has taken this, uh, is responsible for the interprovincial pipeline, that's the end. Journalists have been saying, well, now that the federal government owns it, or is going to be the owner, that changes everything. I'm not so sure that it does. So because of the reasons you pro properly said, the province has a great deal of power and maybe we're moving to the states' rights kind of world that Perry referred to. But whether we do or not, we shouldn't, we shouldn't just discard that as a possibility. Let's see what the Court of Appeal says. Hello, um, I've got a couple of um, questions, but first of all, from any objective analysis, uh, this doesn't have any merits whatsoever, economically, environmentally, or in terms of um, the political impact you know, we're going to have by alienating um, uh, First Nations and so on and reneging on agreements that were made in that situation. Uh, I did a really rough analysis the other day after uh, Rachel sent out her ad to all British Columbians telling us what a great deal this was. And my calculations were that with the 47 billion, I think it is over 20 years, worked out on an annual basis, that works out to be about one tenth of one percent of the Canadian GDP. Uh, not a huge uh, uh, benefit, especially when it's taxpayer subsidized in the first place. So here we are now, we're looking at uh, at minimum of, let's say, a $12 billion um, injection of taxpayer dollars. Um, which, if you do the math again on that one-tenth of one percent, uh, it's going to, we'll never, we'll never recover from that, even if they do make uh, any kind of a revenue like they've discussed, which is very doubtful. Um, I guess the question is, now, you mentioned the Chapter 11 um, situation. Now, does anyone, do you have any knowledge, either one of you, as to uh, what amounts they would actually be suing Canada for? Because relative to 12 billion minimum, maybe it would just be wise to pay that off and get rid of it. If I were Kinder Morgan, I think I would uh, uh, sue for two things. Uh, one would be everything I've already spent on the TMX proposal, which is, let's say, a billion dollars, something like that. And then I would also sue for foregone profits. Now, that would require constructing a financial model of the next 20 years. And if you could do that for oil prices, you're a better man than I, but it would be a very, very large number, uh, which Normally, I mean, it, would, it would be this big in a lawsuit, and they settle for that much, but that much might be, oh, another five million. That's, you know, is that kind of 
by the way, those are, those are real uh, uh, legal precedents. The one that I love particularly was Danny Williams in Newfoundland uh, deciding that somebody who wanted to dig a quarry couldn't, after all. The, uh, the American quarry owner sued and won $154 million, which Ottawa got to pay. Hi. Hello. How are you? I do. Hi. Um, I have a question about this Trans Mountain pipeline that is supposedly going to get that the federal government is. But um, my question is: is what happens if those a spill, who's responsible for it? Us or them? What happens if there's a spill, or what happens if it's built? I couldn't hear you. There's a spill. The Government of Canada will take on all the responsibility with your tax dollars for that. That's what this indemnity that Mr. Morneau first talked about they're so desperate, in my opinion, to get a deal, and Enron, I, I should say, I should say, <laughs> they're so anxious to unload this because of the risk that Barry talked about, that it's hard to believe this was anything but a good deal for, for, for Kinder Morgan. By the way, over the years, they've paid very, very little taxes in Canada. I don't know if you saw the research that's been done from their own financial statements. Minuscule amounts for all the revenue that they've made. So it, the history of the people behind Kinder Morgan gives one a lot of pause. But for sure, the federal government has already promised $1.5 billion for the Oceans Protection Plan. And of course, there's, all, there's some kind of shipping arrangement that, is in, that the marine operators provide some funding, it's true. But in a catastrophic oil spill, it'll be the taxpayers that pay for it. It'll be you. And that's the thing. The company is responsible for the, getting the stuff to the, to the terminal, building the pipeline, getting the people to put the product in the pipeline. But after that, there's not that responsibility on the company anymore. So ultimately, we have minor funds that are, that, that are created, but the ultimate responsibility, the backstop, will be the Canadian taxpayer. That's true. The taxpayer is the ultimate uh, backstop. But uh, there is a provision in the uh, impugned NEB decision that says that uh, uh, the operator of the system, which used to be given more income to the federal government, has to put aside money in a form of letters of credit for, if I remember rightly, about $2 billion against damages. So, put it this way, uh, the first loss would be borne by the operator, and anything above that would fall to the public. Which is the truth. Wave your hands, because it's hard to see. Yep. You gotta wave your hands. <laughs> yes, over here. <coughs> So I'm an academic and I've been searching for an actual reason to support this pipeline and I just, I cannot find one. So what is the Trudeau government using as their rationale for this? What is, what is their reasoning that can't be countered with um, any, anything that, we, that has been said tonight or anything that has already been said? Like is there an actual rational reason for the government of Canada to buy this? Well, you know, it's hard for me to defend it because I'm opposing it, but I often think that uh, you have to understand what the other side says. I think the bald argument that you hear over and over again, if we can't build this mega project in Canada, what kind of country are we? The whole world will look at us askance. We're not a place safe for investment. I've heard that argument a great deal from Mr. Morneau in the last little while. Yeah. And the other thing they say, which, and I think Harry put it well, who knows whether this product is actually going to go from Burnaby over to Asia, where they're going to make $5 more a barrel than they're going to make if they sell it to the United States. That's the assertion we've heard over and over and over again. It's worth tens of billions of dollars every year to the Canadian economy, etc., etc. But a lot of people are saying it's just going to take a left turn when it leaves uh, Vancouver and head south to Long Beach, California. Who knows, right? Who they sell it to is their business. So 
A, the premise is you're going to make more money if you sell it to Asia. Well, who knows if that's true because a lot of the work was done when we had $100 barrel oil. Now we got something less and the product is, as you know, diluted bitumen is very, very uh, costly to refine and you get less on the, on the, uh, on per dollar for, for, for barrel for that. And secondly, who knows whether we're going to get a premium for it. Is that true? We keep asserting that. Robin Allen is the former... Uh, CEO or CEO of uh, ICBC and now a, an economist in Vancouver and she uh, has done an enormous amount of work which I invite you to look at online and she has exploded these these arguments but nevertheless reputational risk not a, pl a place you want to invest anymore in the world Canada is no longer around as a place that's safe to invest because you can't build anything because everybody's going to protest and etc etc and secondly what about more money for us that's the, that's the other argument that you keep hearing about oh and by the way it's just safe uh, British Columbia is being spoiled you know we're not proud Canadians it's something that has to be done in the national interest so those are the arguments they use to beat you about the head <laughs> I'm actually, I'm going to walk out of the shadows. Okay, um, I actually have a question not for the folks on stage, although you guys are so knowledgeable in there. Thank you a lot for the information sharing. Um, I have a question for everyone in the room, which is how many people here would be able to volunteer your time to help stop this pipeline? Oh my gosh. This is so cool. Um, I, I really think this is the most important question we have to ask because this pipeline isn't going to stop itself, but when, if everyone who raised their hands actually can put in a little bit of work, you know, we are more than a match for our federal government. I think we're pretty unstoppable. <laughs> called the, the Salish Sea Organizing Collective. Also, there's another group called Rise and Resist Kinder Morgan. Um, we just thought, because there were so many people here, we wanted to take this opportunity to invite people to be involved. Um, Scott and Sue, can you guys stand up for a sec? Scott and Sue and I, we have some email and sign-up sheets that we're going to hang out by the doors as folks trickle out, so that if you want to hear about what we're doing, um, we can let you know. So we're doing things like um, organizing a trip out to Burnaby to support the Coast Salish Watch House on the front lines of Burnaby Mountain, um, and some other projects like that. And so if you want to hear about that, come talk to us. Um, I also want to encourage everyone, um, even if you don't, don't want to join a group, just to get together with some of your friends, you know, make like an evening out of calling all of the federal ministers um, and do what you can, because I think we're actually really powerful. Look at how many people are here. Um, yeah, thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. We have some people in the front who can try to get uh, their, the attention of our roving microphone people. I've got, I've got the mic. It's called this, um, the Salish Sea Organizing Collective. But actually, on Facebook, if, if the easiest way to find us is a Facebook group. It's called Rise and Resist Kinder Morgan. Rise and Apostrophe Resist. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I have a question. I have a question. So, um, what I'm curious about is when the purchase is made, whether or not the purchase transfers the previous agreements that were made, mutual benefits agreements with First Nations, or whether this is an opportunity to renegotiate some of those, because I think that the process of consultation we know was flawed. I, I, I actually happen to be privy to some particular um, circumstances where negotiations were made um, almost like bribes offering to build infrastructure or a community center or something and the community really didn't have a vote so some of those mutual benefit agreements are questionable that's not for me to say I guess in, on behalf of different communities but what I'm wondering is since um, Romeo Saganash's bill passed third reading this week to regulate and legislate the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Is there an opportunity now with the purchase to, uh, for the NDP or the opposition to really speak up for improving the consultation to maybe look at some of those mutual benefit agreements and to see whether or not those, that purchase is going to 
either honour those or approve those or how they factored in legally with the change of hands? The first part of your question, I think, has an easy answer. Yes, all of the agreements that have been made so far, all of the licenses and so on granted by the provincial and federal governments for the project continue. Uh, the, the specific agreements with First Nations are uh, uh, not, let's say, mandated by legislation and are certainly open to revision if both sides want to do it. One, one little footnote there, uh, I, I thank you for referencing Romeo Saganash's historic uh, commitment. We got through uh, Parliament this week the commitment to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. And then we went 34 years of Romeo Saganash's life and it was very, very emotional. So question one. This, the fact that the owner is now a Crown Corporation, the Government of Canada, and not a regular business proponent, make any difference? And, and number two, if the federal government is now committed to the UNDRIP in law, and all of a sudden new permits, new conditions arise going forward, I think there could be a different ballgame. What do you think, Harry? Well, there's a real question about whether this would be re retroactive. Uh, if, uh, if the adoption of the UN Declaration means that we have to go back and renegotiate the building of the CPR. <laughs> <laughs> the question is how far can we go back? Uh, the usual legal technique, and I thought my learned friend, is that uh, uh, it's from here on. Yeah, yeah. The only, th the only reason I say this, as someone pointed out, I think it that one of us did, that there's a whole bunch of permits that still haven't been applied for, you know? Going forward, there's like half of them haven't even been applied for. Now we have the Government of Canada. The Government of Canada won't have consulted, and it's a, I would have thought, a higher, higher burden than just a regular old proponent, now that they're a Crown Corporation running this. Uh, I, I disagree with my learned friend as the survivor of the number of Crown Corporation boards. I want to tell you that we never held ourselves to a higher <laughs> no, I, th I think the, uh, the acceptable view would be that if this is to be a crown corporation and that's not clear yet, then it would have the rights and obligations of a corporation in law in the ordinary way. We'll see about that. <laughs> okay, who's okay. next? Marie? Right up in the front. Um, Right here. Um, I only have really one question related to another question, which is, can we stop it? And how can we stop it? Are we stuck with it? That's all I want to know. I'll, I'll start. I'll start. You know, uh, Mr. Trudeau used to talk a lot uh, when, in an earlier incarnation about only uh, governments uh, grant permits, but only communities grant permission. You probably heard that social license argument. Look, uh, I think there are two. There was a very interesting article I'm looking at McLean's magazine this week by a guy named David Mosprop, and he said the two things are gonna that are gonna stop it are uh, courts and streets. Which I thought summarized it very well. From a kind of a capital markets point of view, my question would be how on earth could the project possibly be done? I have this vision of, uh, you know, there's a bunch of guys out there with pickaxes and pipes, and I want to put them in the ground and burn them. And Mr. Trudeau appears with the RCMP behind him. There's a bunch of protesters. And Derek Corgan appears with the local police force. Guess what? The RCMP behind him. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and the other thing with it is money. Money always talks in this. And the New York Times had an article just this week. The very day that Trudeau announced this, and this disappeared. The Royal Bank of Scotland announced its decision that the Canadian that they would curtail financing of carbon intensive projects like those in the oil sands region. So the Royal Bank of Scotland, and including Mark Carney, 
Thank you very much. You might remember Mark Carney, who was the head of the Bank of Canada, now in the Bank of, the U of England. He has been talking a great deal to, board, uh, to boardrooms about whether or not we can afford, given the risk, to continue to finance carbon intensive projects. Well, guess what? This is a carbon intensive project. It's costing us $4.5 billion for the 65 year old leaky pipeline, but at least another $7 billion dollars for the project and who knows whether that's just the usual seven billion is your starting game it's going to be according to robin allen 15 to 20 billion all in and so whether it's 12 whether it's 15 those are big you know a billion here a million there it begins to add up <laughs> so um in terms of strategies in terms of strategies we know that bitumen to be transported needs to be diluted to be diluted, it needs natural gas condensate. That condensate comes primarily from BC. And we know that we, the tar sands are the biggest consumers of BC condensate, natural gas condensate. So, um, and, and increasingly, that is extracted through fracking. So I'm, I'm wondering if there's an opportunity there. If there's a, I mean, uh, part of me thinks about the hypocrisy for British Columbians to a certain extent, because as taxpayers, we benefit from, uh, from the money, theoretically, that is being earned by selling the condensate to the tar sands. Um, and I wonder if there is an opportunity for us to do anything at a legislative level, at a um, protest level, at addressing the companies that are creating the condensate and sending it over to the tar sands. That's a very good question. Recipes for dill bit vary from company to company and are usually trade secrets. They are, as you say, mostly uh, uh, pentanes plus condensate. Mostly, uh, at least the Canadian sourced part of it, comes from the Monty Basin in northeast BC. Um, that's a very condensate rich field. Um, the figures on this are not very clear, but it would appear that about 600,000 barrels a day of diluent is currently being used, about 60% of which comes from the United States by rail, from uh, Bacon and other uh, fields, um, fracked fields in the States. The rest of it, about 250,000 barrels a day, perhaps, uh, is coming from the Monty. Uh, those are uh, fracked wells. They are licensed by the British Columbia Oil and Gas Commission. Uh, if uh, the BC government wanted to stop them, they have mechanisms to do so. But the problem is, of course, that if they did, that 250,000 barrels a day would simply be replaced by further imports from the United States. Good question. Next. Hi. Um, I have one of the arguments that the anti, that the pro pipeline people get is jobs. And this is affecting a lot of, of people. They're saying, well, we're going to lose our jobs. I'd like you to debunk that, please. I can start by debunking it. And again, I would go to what Robin Allen has said. She, you know, the government throws around this line, 15,000 jobs. It's nonsense. It's a, a, percent, a tiny or percent, a percentage of that. And she goes through and explains why over the years, uh, when those numbers were first brought out, the changes have occurred. I won't take you through it, but her analysis is very, very uh, uh, compelling. The other thing is, what about British Columbia? I hate to sound parochial, but maybe 90 jobs after the construction period you know, in, for the whole of Alberta and British Columbia. So it's not a, it's a construction project, after which it's, there's not that much going on for, 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 uh, for jobs for our, our communities. Project proponents and the governments that support them just love big numbers. Think of Site C. The, uh, the numbers that uh, Kinder Morgan put forward in the NEB hearings were about 2,500 jobs on construction for two years, not in about 5,000 first years of work to build the project. And as Murray said, a very small number of jobs there. 
Right. Yeah, just last week, Mr. Mordo said 15,000 jobs. It's errant nonsense, and they, we, they continue to say these things with absolutely no proof. She went back to the source of that, which was a Bank of Nova Scotia study, which was, mis which, which was taken out of context. And, we, and even if it were true, it's no longer at then, which it wasn't, she points out, it certainly isn't now. So the numbers are wildly inflated. Uh, my name is Jan, and I don't know if this has been mentioned. I don't know if this has been mentioned previously, but today I received an email from Elizabeth May to say that the sale is not completed. She's circulating a petition that everybody can sign to halt the sale, and the petition is open till September. But the sooner you sign it, the better. Yeah, I mean, certainly petitions are, are an important tool. Uh, remember, the government's all in on this. You need to understand the, the great political calculation that Mr. Trudeau has made. He has, he has basically decided that he's all in for this pipeline. So a petition in Parliament, I've stood up and done many of them. Ask yourself, in the, in the face of this commitment that he's making to big oil, to the people of Canada and the people of Alberta, whether a petition is going to change his mind. I personally don't think so, but I'm obviously all in favor of standing up and delivering it. Uh, I'm skeptical. Hi, everybody. I just want to uh, say something real quick. I know a lot of you are getting tired from holding your arms up, and I'm trying to run around, but I think what's best is maybe if I hold the mic at the front, that we can do a little bit of a cue. But that, yeah, we'll have one mic on this side, one on the other side. Thanks for being here. Just uh, for the The gentleman in the back suggested it, so thank you. And there usually is a, a period of time between the announcement of the deal and so forth, and then she closes and all final people do. And that is because uh, under stock exchange rules, uh, if there is a material change in the circumstances of a corporation, it must be publicly announced. So that guarantees a period of time. That period of time is occupied with that period of time. That period of time between announcement and financial close is filled with uh, uh, a whole lot of commercial paper shuffling. It has very little to do with government regulation. Okay, who's first? Right here. Okay, we're over here. I wanted to ask, um, because after the announcement came out, I, I heard that apparently there were two other lines that were would have taken the oil from the tar sands, two different companies, that would have gone down to the States instead of to Asia, but they were they were ones who actually wanted to get the stuff from the tar sands to go down. Um, so that I was kind of puzzled. Um, I could see whatever arrangements have been made while they were still focusing on Kinder Morgan. I couldn't quite understand them when Alberta would have jumped at it, because they'd still be getting ready their jump, right? The other thing I want to mention is because we're on the coast, we're talking about the water. I'm from the north, and a family member was working um, out on one of the fields with uh, people in the wintertime dealing with uh, pipelines, and, and uh, the condensate that's needed to get the sludge through is highly, highly flammable. And there was a small leak somewhere. My brother couldn't believe it. He said there was just sparks of just jumping all over this open field out with snow. But imagine that that's somewhere where there's forest fire uh, risk or holes or something like that. We haven't talked about it because I understand why here we're talking about the water. But let's not forget the pipeline crosses other places too. That, that's a really good point, that risk, uh, especially as we see climate change having its impact and forest fires becoming more prevalent. That's an interesting point that I never heard before. Uh, on the first point, of course, Alberta's big pitch, Canada's big pitch is we've got to get this to tidewater. So sending it down to Texas, so sending it down to Long Beach, California, where the refineries are, isn't in their interest because they believe that there will be this benefit, this differential in price that they'll get if they can get it over to Asia. Again, a dubious proposition, not necessarily still the case. It was at $100, whether it is now is another uh, question people are asking. Just go back and forth. Tell us. I can't ask you. My name is Gilles again. I attended uh, 
They're protesting. Yesterday, with two other elders, they both happened to be my relatives. We led the march to Spirit Square. I spoke there and I mentioned, I raised my hands to John Horgan and the NDP, the Green Party, for standing up to the government now. But also I mentioned John Horgan's claims to protect the water, the land, and the people. I also mentioned, what about Site C? You might have seen Harry uh, clap here. I think that's just a coincidence. Harry was, of course, and I failed to mention it when we started, he was the chair of the Federal Provincial Review Panel into Site C for his sins. I also mentioned, why is there a double standard? It's okay for the pipeline, but what about Site C? Is that protecting the land and the sea and the people? No. So I ask you, what about Site C? Stand up and stop it. I happen to be at the legislature. Murray was there. And I interrupted John Horgan and I asked him to stop Site C. So I see him. Thanks. Thank you for Hey, my name is Sean. I've just spent the last five years fighting the uh, federal government, trying to recruit anywhere between 100 and 500 million dollars that was taken from the people of BC and ended up in the federal government's hands. And when I ended up in court three weeks ago in Vancouver, Honorable Justice Neal, his answer when it came down to fairness is that he could not rule on fairness. At the end of the day, what the CRA, what the government had told the people of British Columbia, it didn't matter what they told them. So my question is, at the end of the day, all these things that were being told now by the federal government, if they're not correct, or if something goes wrong, are they just going to go back and say, it doesn't matter, fairness doesn't count? Um, these, are, these are the waters that we enjoy. These are the waters of British Columbia. I'm a fisherman. And if something happens to these water, are they just going to come back and say, it doesn't really matter, fairness doesn't count? This is what we've been experiencing dealing with the federal government. And that's what I've experienced for the last five years. Thanks, Johnson. I just wanted to mention something. Oh, okay. Um, 4.5 billion. <laughs> Five billion that the federal government is going to be purchasing the Kinder Morgan. I want you to mention that every year three billion dollars is given by the federal government of our taxpayers' money to the oil companies as a subsidy. And I don't know whether too many people know about that. And I feel very, very strongly about that. Sub those subsidies should go to sustainable energy. So we will not need point I tried to make when I summarized it. You know, this is such a lost opportunity. If we're serious about transitioning to a low carbon future, which we must be, how on earth is this going to assist us in that? I don't see it. So thank you for bringing that to that, that <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, three things. One is that I believe that Tonight, I'm really happy that you organized this and brought people here. Um, but most of what Harry, I believe your name is Harry, said today, tonight was un we were couldn't hear it in the back. 95% of what you said, and it's very frustrating because I wanted to hear what you had to say. So think of that 95%. So I'd like to hear a do over of this tonight, number one. 
Um, and number two, I think, I think it needs to be said more than once that when you have gatherings like this, this energy needs to be captured in, you know, like um, very specific things that we could be doing now. Because all of us are busy and all of us are, you know, have a lot of distractions. So it needs to be captured while we are here, things that we could be doing now. And then the third thing is uh, in, in terms of the, the issue around uh, government, I mean, uh, business. Okay, so in, are we open for business? Um, we've known since the 60s uh, that this is a problem. Um, we, uh, other countries have taken it on uh, renewable energy in such a big way that my understanding is that's how they're making their money. Now I'm not sure about that, I don't have the stats on that, I'd love to be able to get some stats so that we could use that as, um, as uh, ammunition. So for example, my understanding is that uh, places like Sweden have been um, investing money and time and energy into renewable energy to the point where that's, they're making more money through renewables. And so I, I want to know some stats around that to see if that's actually true. Well, thank you for that. And I'm sorry that the audio wasn't as good uh, uh, as it could have been. On the issue that you raised about renewables, of course, Germany is a world leader as well as Sweden, and Canada could learn a great deal. Uh, obviously, the, uh, the amount of money that we're spending on this pipeline, if you think about the four and a half billion plus the seven or eight billion, all total, imagine how many solar collectors, imagine how many wind turbines, imagine the research we could do to make Canada a world leader. Geothermal is an area we have an enormous advantage in. I think the point is well taken, but that requires political leadership, and this government now, your federal government, is all in on the fossil economy, despite the rhetoric to the contrary. They will claim that it's wrapped up with this grand bargain to get provinces to accept carbon pricing. I understand that, but the amount of time and money they're, uh, they're going to be spending and the direction they're taking Canada makes a lot of young people that I talk to particularly really anxious about the future. Uh, with climate change, and this leadership this is what I think we need in order to achieve what other countries, like you say, Sweden, Germany, and elsewhere have done. That's the travesty. It's, it's the opportunity cost of the dollars. What could have been done if we didn't spend it on this that troubles me? that this week uh, the British Columbia government licensed the first geothermal project in the this week, the BC government licensed the first geothermal project in the province. But let me turn the question around and say, suppose we were really serious about greenhouse gases. We would then list, we'd make a huge list of all the alternative ways of doing this. And we'd take the cheapest first. And the next, and the next, and the next. Sometimes our classic renewable energy is not the cheapest. We have um, independent power projects selling electricity into the grid, into the BC hydro grid, at an average price that is well above even Site C. Well, that's a pretty expensive way of doing it. On the other hand, the railways use about 3% of the total um, energy in the province of uh, moving coal from Rockies, but moving goods across the province. If uh, those railroads were electrified, yeah. run on hydroelectricity, we'd save a big amount of money. The question is what it would cost to do it. There were some studies a long time ago that indicated that the internal rate of return was about 4%. Since then, relative prices have changed all over the place. But it's probably not that big an issue. And I'd love to see or the Canadian Transportation Commission or the railways undertake a serious study of that. Yeah. I think that's exactly right. 
Dr. White, and I know we have in the audience an expert on this uh, in Rafe Sunshine who's put a lot of energy into the interconnected grid east to west of electricity that would make so much difference. And don't forget retrofitting. It's not how much energy you get, it's how much you can keep. And remember that successful retrofitting program of BC Hydro used to get us, you know, propagandize on how we can save energy? If we save energy, if we use it, if we insulate properly and so forth, there's huge savings there as well. So we, we could do so much in this country. We're the biggest energy waster on the planet, by the way. Okay. I just want to say two things. For those who uh, haven't been able to hear that well this evening, I will post a recap of what both Marie and Harry have said this evening. I'll post it on Facebook and send it out via email as well for you to have a look if you'd like. Uh, secondly, Harry has about five minutes, so for those in line, I'm going to ask uh, if you want to come to the front if you have something specifically you want to ask Harry. Uh, but if not, we'll just carry on. Yeah. This question is addressed to both of us. Uh, oh, you, yeah, sorry. Speak up. Um, the uh, future is pretty obvious, the electric, hydrogen fuel, that sort of thing, and as you say, energy uh, efficiency and so forth. Once you pay Dane Geld, you're never rid of the Dane. Uh, if every fossil fuel company can hold the country to ransom to go away, how much will it cost us to be rid of these fossil fools? Yes. Thank you. Can't tell if it, it, it is on it. Okay. I, as a deaf person, uh, unfortunately, I've been deaf for a long time, and I just want to say that I go to so many protests, I go to so many rallies, and I go to so many public meetings, and the audio problem is incredible, and it carries on. So I just want to say, uh, microphones changed about seven or eight years ago, or ten years ago, to, to need to be held in front of your face like this, really close. You have to look like you're about to bite the head off the microphone in order for it to work. So when we're holding it down here, it's not going to work. So it's a, it's a quick fix, and, and thanks to the young people doing sound up there, uh, I really appreciate it. It was obvious that that microphone wasn't loud enough all the way along, so it's exhausting for a deaf person. I just want to say, you know, please try hard at it when you have a public meeting. Um, so, uh, that's, I, that was just a quick thing. Uh, I want to ask what people think about the media in Canada, the corporate-owned media, and, and what, what on earth can we do about that? If the fossil fuel industry has uh, this country held for ransom, and uh, so does the corporate media to the degree that the resistance to this project has been suppressed, I think, so badly. I follow this really closely because I've got time on my hands these days, and I'm, I'm really amazed, and I've been a long-time CBC supporter and fan, and I'm so disappointed with how CBC has handled it. We can do uh, to raise the profile of this because it, it, the dominance of the corporate culture uh, that obviously believes in their heart that this is a good project uh, is is going. You know, they've just got us all. The, uh, the only other thing I want to say is that Rachel Notley claims we talk about misinformation and exaggeration. She claims that there's millions of jobs involved in this, not thousands, but millions. And the CBC doesn't contradict her. Yeah. Nobody, nobody calls her on I, I think your, your concern is really an excellent one. And even in, in my lifetime, I've seen an atrophy of, of media. Uh, and, you know, it's sad because print media is dying in this country. It's dying. Uh, people are getting their information from the Internet more and more. And there's less and less uh, uh, interest in investigative journalists. We used to have a thing called the... Canadian Center for Investigative Journalism, which doesn't exist very much anymore. The, the organization is, is gone. So we really do have to struggle to get, not fake news, if you've heard that expression before, 
and I, I totally agree with what you're, what you're saying. The CBC has, in my judgment, really, really dropped the ball on this particular file. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> After this question, I'm going to let Harry escape, and we'll continue. between using our CPP for Kinder Morgan, and nobody seems to have mentioned any of that, so I'm wondering where that's going. So let me be the one to tell you that I put that out there because Mr. Morneau initially said that he had spoken with the directors of the CPP Investment Board, which is a fairly independent and highly respected organization that controls the investments that CPP makes on your behalf and my behalf. And there was musing on his part that there was all this interest in our pension funds. And indeed, one of the directors, I think the chair, I don't remember, said, oh yes, this could be an investment. Not would be, but could be the kind of investment they were making. And I think a lot of people just at that point blanched. Are you kidding? My pension dollars in this project? That really concerns me as well. But there's nothing to say they couldn't, if they get a rate of return, they think appropriate. There's nothing at all that says they couldn't invest in this particular project. With that, I want on your behalf to thank Harry for coming. Thank you very much. Harry. to a number of climate change conferences. And people say, you're from Canada? Tar sands, tar sands. If Canada, and when I was at the last one in Paris, when I was at the one in Paris, Ban Ki-moon said that negotiators should negotiate not with a national, national interest, but with a global vision. Now, a global vision in Canada would be closing the tar sands. going to use against us will be NAFTA, and as, as Harry pointed out, this could be billions and billions of dollars. Well, under Chapter 11, there is a small mention of legitimacy of solving a project for environmental reasons. Now, if we close the tar sands, we can argue we're closing it for environmental reasons to fulfill our long-time obligations, not the Paris obligations, because they weren't even obligations, they weren't commitments. All they were were contributions. What we have to fulfill are the commitments and responsibility and obligation under the UN framework of climate change. So I think we should close the tar sands. And I remember we had a rally here some time ago and there was a long banner in front of the legislature. It said no tar sands, no pipelines, no tankers. The First Nations said that. Then everyone who spoke after said just no pipelines, no tankers. I think we've got to say no tankers, no pipelines, no, no tar sands, and no tankers. And I think that's the only way to go and put the money into the billions of dollars into renewable, socially equitable, and environmentally sound renewable energy. And I think we've got to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The trouble me to read the reputation Canada has now been getting in places like England, The Guardian, The New York Times, the, uh, you know, Bill McKibben, who's of course an activist in, this, in the climate change field, uh, said this week that uh, our Prime Minister is going, quote, fully in the tank for the oil industry. And then he says that we know now how history will remember Justin Trudeau, not as a dreamy progressive, but as one, of, one more pathetic employee of the richest, most reckless industry in the planet's history. That's what I'm about to it's the reputation that he went to Paris and you know Canada is back. We're going to take leadership to this, running, buying for who knows how much money ultimately, and twinning a pipeline like this. It is, as a Canadian, it's disturbing the reputation loss that we're going to suffer around the world. Uh, yes, thank you uh, for arranging this. I appreciate it very much. Um, as Harry Swain said earlier, um, Canada has gone nowhere in decades, decade after decade, in addressing climate change. 
It's been 20 years now since I wrote a series of articles in which I interviewed many of the world's top leading scientists. I had an old acquaintance at the time, the late Digby McLaren, who was a signatory to the, I believe it was 1992, World Scientists Warning to Humanity. The last time I talked to him, I phoned. He was in Ottawa. He was very cynical and, and very sad. And he, he felt that, uh, that there wasn't a lot of hope. That in particular, his and his fellow scientists' message was not being heard, and that it was actively being blocked. Recently, we've heard words like, uh, um, uh, excuse me for a moment, uh, we've heard uh, terms usually reserved to sociologists, like deep state. Um, I believe that the main problem we have here right now is actually a crisis of democracy. Um, and, and, and we've talked about that a lot that's the core of the problem and why we're not getting anywhere. Um, does anyone have any ideas on how that crisis of democracy might be solved so that we can actually make some inroads against the captive agencies that are running this country? And that's just what I was going to say. You have an opportunity to consider proportional representation as a way to make a change. So 39% of the uh, people who vote for one party don't give that party 100% of the power, which happened not just in the last federal election, but in the election before that as well. And there's an opportunity, at least in this province, to show the way and make, make a change. But it's a very deep question that you're asking. We can do better. Listen, I just want to look at my watch and say to people, uh, you, you're very patient. We have cookies and coffee out there. And I'm wondering what the best way to proceed, Crystal, would be. Would it be to take maybe three more questions and then to ask people to talk one-on-one? -on -one? Or, or but I'm happy to remain, but I don't want people who, who told themselves they were coming and leaving at 7 o'clock to feel that they're trapped. So what do you think I should do? Three questions. Three, three questions and then coffee and cookie. Is that okay? All right, let's do it. Hurry up, Rumpy, if he doesn't have coffee and cookies, so... Go ahead. Yes, sir. Oh, hello. Um, yeah, so just talking on reputation, we also, on this coast, have a reputation of having the most polluted cetacean on the planet, which is the killer whale, which acoustics alone from the tanker traffic are going to cause that cetacean to go extinct. I study whale ecology with David Duffus, who's very lucky to work with him. Recently, and yeah, it's a, it's a crisis situation. This is an extremely endangered species, and I just want to make everyone aware of that. As well as when we're talking about impact and things that we can do, of course, all these movements, please come to the protest. These things are necessary, but ultimately insufficient if you are not divesting yourself from fossil fuels in other ways in your life. Reduce your plastic consumption, please, in any way that you can. Obviously, there's things like medical things that you have coming in, but just look at your waste consumption. I myself am really lucky. I'm a student. I'm incentivized to do so, but I am zero waste. Please look into that. Please look into your waste consumption because fossil fuels do not start and end in a pipeline. They also are the plastic that's wrapped around your food, but how many times you're driving your car with how many people in it. I just want everyone to consider that. Um, as well, just thank you for coming here. It's really encouraging to see so many people who, you know, might not see either the end of this project or the consequences of climate change fighting for my future. I really appreciate it and it's like wonderful to see you here. Thank you very much. Somewhere in here. Yeah. Alrighty. So last year we had more significant climate events in the United States than any other year recorded on history, and that's just statistical fact. And I've been arguing this with coworkers for the last two days. It's a somewhat uh, contentious topic at my work. I've gone through the four reasons outlined at the beginning of this more times than you can count, and people are dead set at it. 
and the people who are running this thing aren't going to be swayed by arguments of environmentalism, or they wouldn't have done it in the first place. They're not going to be swayed by arguments of money unless we really make them bleed for it. And they're not going to be swayed by legislative logic because they already own the conservatives. Trudeau came out in full support of them two days ago. And I don't think John Horgan has made a definitive position putting himself out there as it's not going to happen. I don't think he has the will to prevent it. So it's going to be up to everyone in this room to make sure it doesn't happen. Because if you give the type of people that make projects like this an inch, they're going to take more miles, more kilometers than we can think of. I'd like to propose, and I'm sure there's someone in here already working on it, that we start um, a legal defense fund so we're going to need civil disobedience on the scale of the clay Claw sound and Oka to make sure that our coast isn't ruined. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think we have time for one more and then we're going to have an opportunity to chat informally over coffee. Did I mention coffee? And cookies. Yes. I, I would like to call into question Harry's assumption that the pipeline is not going to profoundly affect climate change. From all my reading, it will. For example, for every year that carbon flows through that pipeline, it will be like increasing the number of cars by 2,700,000. So that means after three years of flowing down that pipeline, that will be 8 million extra cars and emissions going into the earth. And we all know that the pipeline is not about the pipeline. It's about increasing tar sands production by 40%. I was at the Bill Gibbons talk the other night in Vancouver. He said that if we burn all the carbon in the tar sands, it will eat up the remaining global budget for um, greenhouse gases by 30%. So that means Canada, with a population of less than 1% of the Earth, will use up 30% of the remaining carbon budget that the whole world has. Now the moral election of duty in that, it should be enough for us to stop the tar sands right we cannot continue to go in that problem. I also want to call into question the economics of this pipeline and the so-called Asian markets. Who knows how much has been shipped to Asian markets in the last seven years? 600,000 liters, which is less than a tanker. That's how much in Asian markets exist for our really dirty product. In the meantime, since it was created, the proposal for this pipeline was put 11 years ago, two things have happened. They've created tankers four times the size that can get into Vancouver. They have also discovered huge quantities of sweet crude that is fracked in America. It's far cheaper than what we can produce. So those Asian markets are already flooded with cheaper, sweeter crude. And it can be shipped in tankers four times the size that can go into Vancouver. There is no way that this is an economic viable. <laughs> Rise and resist. We will email you. Um, so please join us. We have lots of projects in mind to get everyone in this room working. Thank you very much for your information. And uh, at this stage, I, I have to say that I want to thank all of you. It's again remarkable, always, that you can imagine.
this community coming together in such a short amount of time. I really, really appreciate your interest. We're going to work together. Tonight was designed to be an education session so we can hear the arguments on both sides and try to learn a little bit more from each other, and we've done that. The questions and the statements that were made have demonstrated that. I want to thank you very much for coming out. You can be sure I'm going to continue to be involved. For those of you living in Victoria, please let me know how I can, how I can best re reflect your views. There's a debate this week, I think it's Thursday, maybe Wednesday, in the House. I'm going, it's an opposition day. It's going to be on Kinder Morgan. I'm going to be speaking, and I can assure you that some of the things I learned tonight and some of the things that have been said tonight will be reflected, and, and I hope that Mr. Trudeau across the way is listening. Thank you so much.